Hey, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Global Connections on Think Tech Hawaii. You know, you might have thought that Thomas Friedman's flat world uh, characterization, what is that, 10 or 15 or even 20 years ago, uh, is of interest and value, but the world's gotten much flatter since then, and everything is interconnected. And we have an international trade lawyer, Ralph Winnie, here with us, uh, and we're going to talk about the, uh, the trade agreement, the trade deal that the Trump administration made, phase one with China, uh, after a long trade war. Welcome to the show, Ralph. Thank you, Jay. Great to have you here. You gave yeah. a great talk at uh, the Bar Association at the Damon yeah. Firm uh, last week. We were there, we, uh, we filmed it, and we, we have that on our YouTube channel, by the way, if you're interested in seeing yourself. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> But I'd me, love to share it with my colleagues. Yeah, please do. <laughs> um, now the you know the uh, we we ordinarily we uh, like introduce our guests, but your your uh, bio was so long that I got a, I got an excedrin headache trying yeah. to read it. So I'm going to give you like 30 seconds to introduce yourself. Ready, go. Uh, I'm Ralph Winnie Jr. I'm a partner in the firm of Henson Pang and Winnie. We have a an office located in China called IPO Pang that helps um, to promote reciprocal U.S.-China business. And I run the China programs over at the Eurasia Center in Washington, D.C., a premier global think tank where we uh, study, write, and report about um, emerging trends on bu the business financial um, between U.S. and China. Talk about being in the right time and the right place in yeah. the world and history of yeah. the world. Uh, how did you get into dealing with China? How did you get into in international trade? Well, I worked for a boutique trade law firm in D.C. that had a rep office in China. So I would go over to China periodically with firm clients that had interest in doing business. And um, then just um, maintained the relationships and started with the Eurasia Center and um, engaged with um, people at IPO Pang. And they were looking for someone that could help based in the U.S. to promote reciprocal U.S.-China China trade business. And the most wonderful thing about this is you're yeah. local, right? Absolutely. Um, born and raised in Kailua, went to Punahou, was on the wrestling team. I'm actually on the, <laughs> the board of the U.S. Uh, wrestling Foundation. Is that right? Great. And, yeah, and that's taken me uh, different places, and I've really enjoyed giving back to the sport. Well, let's go uh, top-down news. Okay. Uh, you know, the, the market went down uh, depending on what sure. time you looked at newspaper yeah. this morning. But 800 uh, points. 800 now. points. Yeah. Okay. And that was pretty dramatic, although yeah. it's not a surprise because, uh, you know, the virus has been sort of ca catching yeah. people's attention for right. the past few weeks, only the past few right. weeks. And so what, what does this mean in terms of uh, the trade with China and the international uh, global trade uh, and, for the, that matter, international, the international economy vis-a-vis uh, -vis what everywhere, including the U.S. and China? Well, right now, um, everything is sort of on lockdown in China. Um, People are in quarantine. They've canceled uh, flights in and out of China. Um, people still work, but they're working remotely. And um, people are restricted from going outside of their homes, except in certain instances to go um, buy food, supplies, et cetera. And there's regulations about when people can be on the street and go to their offices. Um, but that hasn't affected people's ability to do business. What's affected is the perception of China as a place to do business. Mm -hmm. um, people think if they go over there, they may catch this virus and they may die. It's very similar to the SARS epidemic about, uh, that lasted for about three and a half months, and everything was kind of in a standstill during mm -hmm. that time. The issue is going to be um, how does that affect the, uh, the trade agreement between U.S. and China? Is everything going to be in a standstill or are we going to continue to move forward into phase two and phase three? I'm confident that given the Chinese government's ability to get things under control, that it's only going to be a matter of time before um, China is back in the, in the international business sphere. Right now, people are diverting um, suppliers um, to other countries. Um, they're looking at other markets. But um, this is thing is something that will blow over, provided the U.S. and China are able to work together and China gets, the, gets, their, gets their hand on it. Um, and I think they are. You know, You're I'm talking about confident. containment and yeah. quarantine, talking right. about international uh, travel bans. And all right, that. and Trump has, has a travel ban already. Maybe there's another one that gets instituted to focus strictly on health. 
You know, the one thing yeah. that I caught in the newspaper, which I really, yeah. really struck me, was that China was applying all its technology. It was trying to be yeah. as smart as it possibly could be. Yeah. In fact, you know, it struck me that China is being smarter than the U.S. would be in similar circumstances because, yeah. it, you know, it takes risks and it has a government that can act immediately. Uh, and it's, you know, completely, totally invested in, in tech. Right. So there was a list of all the things that China is doing to apply tech, all kinds of information tech and oh, demographic tech, you, you name it, medical yeah. tech, um, to try to stop this thing. You know, And it was encouraging. Right. It, uh, you know, The message to me was uh, that China will be able to stop this either by containment or by one of these or a number, a combination yeah. of these t technological yeah. uh, steps it's taking. You're absolutely correct. I mean, the government has put all their resources into doing everything they can on, especially on the tech front to combat this virus yeah. because they realize it, it affects not only their image but also their ability for their people to make money and to engage in global international trade and they don't want to have anything that would stop the entrepreneurial spirit of the Chinese people from reaching its full potential. Yeah, and that, and that includes uh, belt, the Belt and one Road belt, One Road, right. billions and billions and trillions exactly. of dollars. Yeah. It's, one, it's China's form of soft diplomacy to promote economic trade and development between China and the countries um, in Eurasia. You know, yeah. I've been to Turkey, Azerbaijan, Uzbekistan, and I've seen the efforts of the Chinese, you know, to really establish relations in those countries and sort of reform their image in some regards and also show that they're able to bring jobs and economic development to improve the quality of life for people in these other countries. Yeah, raising all boats everywhere. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, that's what China wants people to believe, yeah. you know, because it's important for their image um, to build allies and to allow their people to make money. So I always say, Think of China as the People's Republic of Capitalism, <laughs> a very controlled, ordered system where people for the first time can achieve the American dream. And you talk to any young person in China, what do they want to do? They want to be an entrepreneur. They want to trade. They want to invest. They want to make money. And the younger generation has only known economic peace and prosperity, and they're able to travel, they're able to work and study abroad and to become very Western oriented in their thinking and their training. And when they come back to China, the government realizes that the best way to co-opt these bright, talented young people into the system is a circle of influence or a business development network where these young people um, can can make money and be entrepreneurs. Yeah, we could take a page out of their book. We, we could learn a lot from them even in, in recent years. Yeah, so, well, uh, they look at the U.S. You know, right. and that's important. Yes, we well, we're their model, I suppose, but you know, we're we're, we're not moving as as fast as they are, may I say? Yeah. So here we are, and, and uh, the Trump administration begins. Uh, no sooner is it is it in, in office uh, than we have a trade war. Um, so yeah. I, I, can can we please discuss that because that's sure. the, the context for the trade agreement? Yeah. Uh, did we need a trade war? Well, the good thing about the administration is they did not take the, t the tack that it was a trade war. They always maintained that we're in negotiations with our Chinese partners. And that was the correct approach. See, Trump is not a politician or he's not, and not a diplomat. He is a deal maker. He is a businessman. And it's like, what can you do for me um, to get the Chinese out of, their, out of their element to come to the table and negotiate what the Trump administration would say is a free and fair trade agreement. He mm -hmm. says he respects the Chinese, that they have negotiators that are very tough, smart, and they work on behalf of their people. At, that is certainly at a disadvantage to us because our people are not as smart and intelligent. That was the tr Trump's position. So now that he is in office, he has to prove that he is that deal maker, that businessman. And you know, for the past uh, year and a half, we've, we've been going back and forth on tariffs and duties between the two countries to the point now where we have a phase one agreement. So I'll just go over the general points. Yeah, please. Trump administration canceled tariffs and reduced levies from 15% to 7.5% on $120 billion in Chinese products. The Chinese promised to buy soybeans, pork, cotton, and wheat. There's an opportunity for China to diversify its economy and reform its financial system, which is extremely important to promote transparency and accountability um, for foreign investors. The phase one agreement leaves in place, place tariffs 
on some $370 billion worth of Chinese goods, about 65% of total U.S. imports from the People's Republic of China. President Trump said the U.S. would lift the remaining tariffs if the two sides could reach a second, more substantial agreement. And tariffs that were scheduled to go into effect this past December 15th on nearly $160 billion worth of Chinese goods, including cell phones, laptop computers, toys, and clothing, are, in are suspended indefinitely. China's regulatory December 15th tariffs, including a 25% tariff on U.S.-made autos, have also been uh, suspended. So what are the opportunities and challenges of the trade uh, of this phase one agreement? Opportunities. This deal provides much needed certainty to American businesses as they begin the new year. And this is according to the CEO of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce named Tom Donahue. And he added that it's critical for both sides to begin negotiations on phase two as soon as possible to address significant concerns in the areas of subsidies, digital trade, and data discrimination, and non-trade barriers to U.S. manufacturers and service providers. For those who can stomach volatility, this could be an entry point for longer-term investors into emerging market stocks. Intellectual property and privacy will allow for foreign companies to have a more competitive advantage in the Chinese market. What are the challenges? Chinese um, FDI, foreign direct investment in U.S. industries, fell in 2019 to an estimated 3.1 billion U.S., a fraction of the high of 46.5 billion in 2016, but down 42% from 5.4 billion in 2018, according to a new report by the Rhodium Group. Tariffs still remain on roughly 360 billion of Chinese goods, uh, two thirds, of what Americans buy from China for at least 10 months as a means of enforcement for the deal. Average tariffs on Chinese imports will remain elevated at 19.3%, six times higher than before the trade war started. And this is according to the Peterson Institute for International Economics, um, a well-respected uh, international think tank uh, in Washington, D.C. Um, it's more of a succession of hostilities um, coupled with some barter, and that's according to, um, you know, scholars um, in Washington, D.C. Washington and Beijing have been locked in a trade dispute now for nearly two years. It's not over just with the signing of this partial deal, but it's a reprieve from months of uncertainty and threats of tariff increases. There's also signs of future difficulty on the technology front as the Commerce Department looks to reportedly eliminate a loophole that will let U.S. companies through their overseas facilities sell to Huawei Technologies, a company that's put on, uh, the U.S. has put on its export restrictions list last year. Mm -hmm. And this is very interesting because you have Chinese companies like ZT and Huawei that want to do business in the U.S., but there are allegations that they are really agents for the Chinese government to spy and steal our technology. Allegations that the EU does not agree with, nor does UK agree uh, Correct, with yeah. and this is a very a challenge for the United States. One of the things I felt that was very important was ZTE allowed foreign compliance um, officers to participate and be part of their board as a way to show the goodwill, you know, uh, to promote reciprocal U.S.-China business you know, where people are not disadvantaged and there is no theft of intellectual oh, that, property. That's a so, step in the right direction. Exactly. You know, so hopefully more of that can be done moving forward to allay people's concerns about um, engaging with Chinese companies when they come into the United States. Well, at, the, at the risk of losing nuance on this, uh, yeah. maybe being oversimplistic, <clears throat> is this a win-win, a win-lose, a lose-win? Who came out better? I think the U.S. has come out very strong because for the first time the Chinese were brought to the table um, the f and they have been taken, taken off their game by Trump. Um, when I was in China in November, um, the, all the questions are, well, how, do you, how can we understand Trump? And I basically tell them, um, he's not a politician, he's not a diplomat, he's a steel maker. So when I'm giving a lecture at the China Institute of Technology or at Hangzhou University, I tell them that so that they can understand and have an idea that he's not 
a normal, he's not a diplomat. You know, you got to think, think outside of the box and treat him as if you're dealing, you know, with your, with, with a business, part, a potential business partner. In other words, you can't know. It's always right. going to be a surprise. Exactly. And I think that benefits the U.S. because that element of surprise is always going to keep the Chinese off their game. We're going to take a short break. Uh, that's Ralph Winnie. He's an international trade lawyer here uh, giving talks to the Bar Association and the like, but his office is in Washington, D.C. We're talking about the uh, trade deal. Phase one. We'll be right back. Aloha, I'm Lillian Cumi, host of Lillian's Vegan World, the show where we talk about veganism and the plant-based diet located in Honolulu, Hawaii. I'm a vegan chef and cooking instructor, and I have lots of uh, information to share with you about how awesome this plant-based diet is. So do tune in every second Thursday from 1 p.m. Aloha. Aloha, I'm Stan Osterman, Stan the Energy Man, every Friday here on Think Tech Hawaii. If you're really interested in finding out what's going on in energy, especially here in Hawaii, but also all the way around the world, and especially if it has to do with hydrogen, look into Stan the Energy Man every Friday, 12 o'clock, Think Tech Hawaii. Be there. Aloha. Okay, we're back. We're live with Global Connections on Think Tech Hawaii with Ralph Winnie, who joins us in our studio for a discussion of the, uh, of the trade deal that uh, the Trump administration has just concluded phase one. So you mentioned before the break, Ralph, that there might be a phase two, a phase three. Yeah. How many phases are we going to have? Does anybody know? Uh, will there come? Will we reach nirvana on this at a certain <laughs> phase? Well, think of everything as being negotiable. Okay, I think we are definitely going into phase two for more clarity and substance um, to have a more permanent uh, relationship, um, but. Things will be renegotiated. I mean, the Chinese, that is their hallmark uh, because they want to get the best deal possible for them. So um, I certainly think we are moving forward in the right direction. Getting phase one was key. That's eliminated a lot of uncertainty. Uh, now we're just going to move forward to the next phase and be ready for anything. As a, as a former wrestler, when you go out there on the mat, you just have to be ready for anything. You can study your opponent all you want. But you have to recognize that there are going to be opportunities and challenges, you know, when you're on that mat. And that's what I tell people. You have to recognize that this is not going to be easy. I mean, things are going to come out of nowhere. You're going to have to be ready to engage and be ready to fight, you know, for your interests. You know, that's what Trump, I think, has indirectly said. You know, he's fighting for the U.S. interests, which have not been protected under previous administrations. And that's what we all should want. We should want to have the negotiations fighting for the American people, the American worker, mm -hmm. so that uh, they are not taken advantage of. That's mm -hmm. what the Chinese do on their end. Oh, not to do, take yes. advantage of the U.S. per se, but to fight for their, for their people. Yes. You know, and they're very good at it. So uh, what about how this affects people, affects business? You know, you spoke uh, last yeah. week at the Bar Association yeah. About the ideal client in the circumstance sure. of this agreement. What, what is the ideal client right now? Okay. Well, the ideal client is a client that has sales between five to thirty million U.S. a year. Number one. Number two, the client can be in a variety of businesses, um, such as um, uh, manufacturing, software, retail, online e-commerce, pharmaceuticals, automotive, franchising. That's restaurants and other concepts, including apparel and fashion. Um, the ideal client is someone who wants to enter the Chinese market for sales and services of their products and services. The client could be interested in a joint venture, manufacturing, or direct retailing. Um, often, you can do. It's important to deal with clients that have existing relationships in China, but their joint, say, their joint venture. Partners are no longer playing ball and need conflict resolution. That's key, conflict resolution. Litigation, arbitration, and other conflict resolution proceedings, I think, are very important as you move forward in China. Um, the ideal candidate client includes someone who wants their IP protected. That's trademarks, domains, copyrights, patents. The client would want to have a comprehensive strategy and program in China and need both registration, maintenance, and prevention of counterfeiting. 
And finally, the ideal client would include someone who wants to sensitize their Chinese subsidiaries to the need for compliance with ethical employment HR compliance, including the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Mm -hmm. So yeah. make sure everything is above board on the table, um, that you're doing everything right legally. So you know, that under, is the most important thing. Under this, uh, under this yeah. phase, um, right. the old problem was that the, the Chinese company, you have to go into a partnership, right. uh, and, and uh, even a woofy uh, wholly owned War, foreign service, service. Right. You know, had, had exposures yes. to the loss of intellectual right. property, the loss of trade secrets and all right. that. Has that been ameliorated? Uh, if I go do business in China now, am I going to be subject to the same vulnerabilities of the loss of my secrets? Well, if you go in there on your own, it's very likely because you're a foreigner and you don't know how to navigate the system. You don't have the right partners. When you work with a recognized firm um, that will help you navigate the system, find your joint venture partner, register your company, you know, um, help you pay your taxes, that's the key. Um, and that relationship building. Um, you need people that have relationships with the people in the right business sectors in the government because the government is involved in your pro in, you know in every aspect there um, so that's important does the trade agreement help me now it does provide clarity it provides more access to like the financial markets uh, but you you'll still need to work with a recognized firm when you're there you can try on your own but it's harder especially oh, sure. if you don't speak the language now right. someone like Michael Jordan Okay, when his Air Jordan shoes were being compromised by a Chinese company, he hired a Chinese media publicist um, to promote the theft of his intellectual property and, and also a Chinese firm. And these were two very important strategies because he, his image was promoted in a very positive way that he was working within the Chinese system to combat the theft of his intellectual property. And that's very, very important because you need the media, plus you need the law in China on your side mm -hmm. through these important relationships that are built through your, your legal firm and your media company. In all of this, uh, in all yeah. of this Ralph, where, where, where does a firm like yours uh, fit? I mean, you're an international trade firm, right. and this uh, ideal client you described would yeah. be an ideal client for you, I assume. Uh, so what services can you provide? And, and how do you approach, um, you know, getting getting this client representation in China? Do it yourself? Do you uh, associate with a firm in China? Right. So I cannot legally process? practice law in China because I'm an American trained lawyer. Mm -hmm. So the firm that we rep we work with in China handles all aspects of a particular client's need on the ground in China. But you know? you'll so it's for inbound into China. Correct. Yeah. Yes. So we're like the shepherd, the person that um, is there, but sort of is behind the scenes, you know, because illegally I can't practice law there um, as a foreigner. But we have Chinese trained lawyers that do all of that. And the conflict resolution, the arbitration, the mediation is so important. It's so important to register your patent and your trademark in China so you have the protection of the government. Um, so that people do not try and steal it. The problem with the Chinese is the mindset. Under a communist system, whatever I have belongs to you. Um, it's part of that collective. To be, um, to, to claim that I have something of my own, that's being a bourgeois, being a raconteur, a bad person. Mm -hmm. So the whole mindset has got to be retrained to understand that there are certain things of yours that have to be protected. Uh, especially when it's Chinese companies going after other Chinese companies for theft of intellectual property. But it was never an issue until China became a global power. Um, and foreign companies had issues with going in there to do business. So it's, um, it's a very interesting dynamic that's going on. Um, but What about the venue for this um, you know, litigation, arbitration, mediation? Yeah. You know, there was a time when people talked about having that venue right here in Hawaii. Right. That we, we were a good uh, sure. you know, crossroads for it. That hasn't happened, not that, not that I well, know. But where, where is it happening? Are you calling for uh, arbitration mediation venue in China or in the U.S. or where? Well, it, it, would, it would take place in China. Now, it could happen outside of China, you know, if, you're, if it's a global company. 
but generally um, it's within China because the dispute is with a Chinese company. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so it's you know it's a very practical solution. It's just the foreigners don't have the have an have an idea how to get involved in it. Now there are Singapore companies that have been very successful because the people that have brought the cases are ethnic Chinese, so they have a natural feel for how to navigate the system. It's very similar in Russia, where who are the most successful business people? They are the, refu the refuseniks, the children of the refuseniks that, are, ha that came over here when they were eight, nine years old, grew up in the American system, still speak Russia, know the, the culture and the tradition, and then they can go back and know how to navigate the Russian system. Mm -hmm. So you have a lot of uh, Chinese that are born and raised here that go back that um, are very effective in that regard. Um, but it's, it, it is very difficult without the right team over there in China to be very effective. So I get the impression from what you're saying, Ralph, that when we finish, hopefully soon, yeah. with, the, with the virus, right. knock wood, knock wood, and yeah. um, when we finish uh, yeah. you know, understanding and implementing you know, phase yeah. one of the trade agreement, maybe phase two, maybe phase three, yeah. there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. And it means better trade, more reliable relationships, yeah. um, more, what do you want to call it, common prosperity, not only right. between U.S. and China, but for the world. Uh, so uh, those are my words. What are your words? No, I think you're right on. Um, and I think the U.S. and the Chinese economy are, are inextricably linked. Um, the personal relationships that are developed at a very young age are so important. President Xi has made that a, a, one of his commitments to increase ties at the uh, the cultural level, the social level, um, to build those personal relationships that lead to a professional relationship. Um, it is in both the U.S. and China's interest to have a viable trade agreement so there is clarity um, of, of, the, of the issues so that people don't feel on either side that they're being taken advantage of and there's reciprocal U.S.-China business where people benefit and make money. That's wonderful. A wonderful view of the future. I hope it comes true. Knock wood, knock wood. Thank you. We've got a lot of bumps yeah. and grinds along the way, but that could be a great solution for the world. Anyway, thank you, Ralph. Uh, Ralph Winnie, international trade lawyer practicing in Washington, D.C., largely with China, who comes to Hawaii in order to consult with the wrestling team at Kailua High School. Uh, am I right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. But I'd Ralph. like to give a shout out to my old coach, Jim Peacock. Um, he wanted to come to my presentation. He's had a heart attack, and my thoughts and prayers are with him. Thank you. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you, Ralph. Ralph Winnie. Aloha.